Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Erica Rose. Some of you I think I've encountered before, but if this is our first meeting, uh, I'm really happy to be with all of you today and a little bit about kind of the role I play in library land. Uh, I am the program coordinator and full-time faculty for the University of Nebraska at Omaha. We have a fully online undergraduate library science program, and uh, that's my library gig. And it's pretty amazing to work with students all over the country as they pursue their goals to be librarians. And I'm really excited to be here today and talk with you about communication in the workplace. And I'm gonna start off with this very sincere expression of gratitude for allowing me to come and talk to you about this because every time I pull this presentation up, I've been, I've been kind of working on this topic for a long time. I've spoken about it several times over the years. And every time I return to it, I have these moments where I say, get it together, Erica, it's time to practice what you preach. There are many areas in your own life where you can implement a lot of these things. And I think it's really timely for us to be talking about communication in libraries and the workplace right now, because we're at this interesting place, uh, given the events of the last year, where we are sort of rethinking a lot of our communication and interaction habits. And we're sort of getting ready to go back to some sort of normalcy, but I think we're gonna keep some of those shifts that have been made over the past 12 months as well. <laughs> I was talking with my daughter this morning on the way to school. She's 13, she's in seventh grade. And she said before class, they all just sit on their phones and the teacher comes and says, why aren't you talking to each other? You're just on your phones. They're actually texting each other in the same room. And she said, yeah, mom, I've lost my social skills. So um, we're definitely, she was kind of joking, but we're definitely in a place where things are different. And I think in some ways we are really um, missing and have given away some of our connections with humans. And so thinking about how we do this as we start to welcome our patrons back in, as we think about how we're gonna sustain any online options, it's really timely. So for me, uh, communication has been something I've been interested in for a long time. In libraries, I've worked the front desk. I, it's actually my favorite gig ever to work the CERC desk and hang out with patrons. Um, but much of my role in public libraries was focused on PR work. So a lot of communication and interaction. And now as I work with students and I work with other folks um, by the nature of my job, figuring out how to effectively package material and deliver it in a way that connects with people is really critical to what I do. So that's kind of why I started down the path with all of this in the first place. Now, um, I am going to invite you to turn on your cameras today. Notice I use the word invite because I know a lot of people hate that, but as you're going to, thanks Thomas. <laughs> hey, uh, it's really, um, we're gonna learn in a little bit how much we actually get even from being able to see one another. And I know we've got two screens between us, but it is useful for me uh, to be able to see you a little bit. Now, if you are not not willing to play, oh, thanks Jenny, there's another one, I got another one, great. If you aren't willing to do that, I am gonna invite you to hop into the chat box because I have a series of questions that I would like for you to answer. So I'm gonna bring up my chat so that I can monitor responses. But, so this is just an either or question. So if you're, hi Katie, oh, here they come. People are, you guys are amazing. Thanks so much for being willing to play ball with me. Cause it's, it's fun, it's kind of a game. All right, so I'm gonna ask a series of either or questions. No worries, that's great. You guys can put your um, responses in the chat. If it's the answer to, if it's the first option that resonates with you, you're gonna to touch your forehead. If it is the second option, you're gonna to touch your chin. And I would like for you to scan and kind of just get a sense of how everyone is answering. So if you can, go ahead and put your Zoom into gallery view so that you're seeing everybody's faces. Okay, so question one, introvert or extrovert? And I'll play two. Okay, 
great. I'm just gonna wait and see if we get any chat responses and then we'll move on. A couple more introverts coming in. Okay, great. And every once in a while, I'll get somebody who touches their nose, just completely unwilling to commit. That's okay, I, I get it. Not everything is an either or. Next one, group interaction or one-on-one? -on -one? Okay, couple for groups, couple for one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, maybe more for one-on-one, -on -one. wonderful. All right, next. If somebody is giving you big news, you want them to be very direct or sugarcoat it? Okay. I'm right there with you, Jenny. Please give me a little sugar with that blow. All right, cool. All right, next. You consider yourself better at writing or better at talking? Great. Good. A little bit more of an even split there. Um, next, this one, I, I tested these out on my husband last night and he was, he, he was a lot of that. You can't ask me that question, but he's an attorney and he likes to argue about everything. So, uh, next question is black and white or gray. So are you black and white thinker or more gray? Yeah, the gray one would probably always touch their nose, right? That's probably, but I'm, I'm more. A lot of gray. Jennifer, black and white, love it. Diane, excellent, okay. <laughs> Next one, Facebook or TikTok? Katie, you're like, I'm not playing, stop it. Get out of here. <laughs> okay, last one, lots of Facebooks, lots of neithers, okay. And the last one is read it or watch it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm right with it. It depends, right? For a lot of us, it depends on format, but let me, <laughs> okay. okay. Let me change it for you. If you need to learn something, do you prefer to read about it or watch a video about it? <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Depends. Okay. That was all of my questions. Thanks for humoring me. There are differences there. We, not a single one of you had the same responses. If we, you know, lined it all up, you wouldn't see that, that there was complete overlap in all of your responses across the board. We are all different. And all of those questions were really things that impact communication in a big way or were examples of some of our communication preferences. And I want you to just think about those differences as we move through um, the rest of this conversation. We need to think about what these differences mean in terms of how we frame our interactions with others um, and how we think about how to most effectively get our message to them, which gets me to my next point, which is maybe we better think about what communication actually is. What is the definition? So just another, um, logistical issue with how I'm handling this today. I'm going to share my screen and stop sharing and share and stop sharing because I really just want to look at all of you all the time, but it's useful for you to see some of this written out. So um, I apologize for the back and forth, but I think it's worth it. So what is communication? This is a definition that I think is useful giving and receiving or exchanging ideas, information, signals or messages through appropriate media. I think we could change this to channels very easily. Enabling people to persuade, to seek information, to give information or to express emotions. That's a pretty significant definition. That's heavy. There's a lot that's included there. There are specific words there that I think are really important to highlight exchange, I think is something that we sometimes forget in communication. We think a lot about, I need to throw stuff at you. I need you to get it. I need you to do what I tell you to do. But exchanging information means that every time we put something towards somebody else, there should be something coming back to us and we need to be open to that. Um, giving and receiving. 
right along with that. I feel like those are really important words that are included in this definition. And if you think back to all of those communication preferences that you all shared with me, uh, no wonder this is hard. No wonder we sometimes struggle with communication because if we all need something different and I need some sugar with that, but you prefer to be really direct, uh, it's going to be hard for us to have a meeting of the minds all the time. And we tend to think about our own communication preferences first, right? Those are our instincts. Um, so the way that I really decided was the most effective approach to thinking about communication was to continue to dig into the actual process of communication. What happens? I don't usually use resources from 1949 in my um, research and work, but in this case, I'm gonna make an exception because I think that Shannon Weaver's model of communication is really useful here. And quite frankly, it's still kind of the gold standard as a lot of social psychologists continue to explore this topic. And of course it's used in telecommunications theory as well. But this is a communication exchange here. This is a perfect model for it. You can see you have a sender and encoder, that big gray block in the middle, noise, we're gonna talk a lot about that, a decoder and a receiver. It looks kind of fancy, but I'm gonna give you a breakdown here. There are four elements that I wanna hit on first. The first one being the sender. So this is the originator of the message, the information source. For example, you. You need to initiate communication with one of your colleagues or patrons. You are the sender. The next step is the transmitter that converts the message into signals. So if we're gonna stick with our example, you are gonna create an email through your Gmail account. That is the encoding process. The decoder is the reception place for the signal that converts the message. It's the reverse of encoding, obviously. So what that really means is then on the other end, your colleague that you sent the message to, they're getting that email maybe through their Outlook account. And then they're reading it, right? The person on the other end is actually getting this message and you're gonna have this communication exchange. Piece of cake, you type an email, you send an email, they read the email, no problem. Except for we have that big gray block in the middle that was noise. And that's where we really need to think about how communications sometimes get scrambled. Noise is anything that interferes with the integrity of your communication transmission. And there are a lot of ways that noise can show up. For instance, Maybe your email ended up in spam. That's a problem. Maybe the coding differences between Outlook and Gmail removed your bullet points and all of your color coding, and so they're not seeing the things that you were highlighting. Maybe you decided to type in all caps, and that spiked the anxiety and maybe even some anger for the receiver on their end. Another piece of noise is, I mean, if you spell, misspell their first name, you're going to impact the way that they are perceiving that communication and how you are perceived by them. Maybe you sent the email at 2 a.m. and that causes them to worry about whether or not they're working enough or wonder what you're doing up at 2 a.m. and they're not even thinking about what the message is really telling them. These are just some examples of all of the things that can go wrong in a very simple email exchange. Another one that I see a lot is you were in a hurry and maybe you did not include salutations or complimentary closings, which just doesn't feel like it's a very big deal, but it may make that communication feel really abrupt. It might come across as bossy. It might come across as curt or cold, especially for those of us who like sugar. So it just kind of depends on the personality of the receiver. Really, if we wanna boil noise down to a succinct definition, it's anything that is a barrier to access and understanding. We get this in libraries. We think all about barriers to access and we're eager to remove those, especially when we think about our services or the way people are accessing our collections or our programs. We need to apply those same skills to how we communicate with people through everyday interactions. 
And you know where I was first introduced to this idea of Shannon and Weaver's communication model was when I took my reference class in grad school. This was the way that the reference interview was introduced to me. You need to think about noise because this is what's often interfering with those communications where somebody tells you they want a book about Florida, but after 10 minutes of conversation, you realize they really want a book about alligators, right? So that's where this whole idea came from. And I think in some ways we are strategically positioned and built to be the best communicators there are because we are so sensitive to asking good questions and really listening to answers. So if noise is the issue, we have to think about what noise looks like so you can figure out if you can remove the barriers, where the barriers exist, and then if you can remove them. So there's four types of noise here. Physiological noise, physical noise, semantic noise, and psychological noise. So let's look through these one by one. Physiological noise is happening on both sides of the aisle. You've got noise, I've got noise. Right now, my noise looks like the fact that my feet are freezing. I wish I had put socks on before I came in this room. Um, I didn't eat breakfast, I'm regretting that as well. And you know, my computer monitor was being hinky with me and so I'm having a little bit of, of internal stress about that as well. You have noise happening in your physiological noise happening in your life as well. I think one of the big ones that we all know about is hangry, that state of anger caused by lack of food. Don't worry, I'm not hangry yet. Um, it was good that we were, you know, doing this early in the morning. The next one is the physical noise. So this is actual interference in our environments made by others. This is the crying baby the patron that brings in their child and they scream, <laughs> it's, it's the cat, exactly. Which I don't know about you all, but I love it when people's pets show up to Zoom meetings. I am delighted. But I also understand that it is it does introduce a bit of physical noise. Um, it's also external barriers. It's this when we're talking to people or closing ourselves off. It's that lack of eye contact when you're having that face-to-face -face conversation with somebody, they see somebody else walk into the room and they go like this and you know, oh, they're those. They're so done listening to anything that I've said because this person is more interesting or important than I am. Um, a lot of times we even create physical barriers through the way that we set up our environments with that service desk, or if you are a supervisor with a desk in your office, if you're going to have a really hard conversation with somebody and you put a big barrier between the two of you, you have set a very clear message about boundaries, which can be a good thing. It can be something that we use to our favor, but you need to be aware that sometimes if that's not your intent, you would be better off rethinking where you are having these conversations. It's one of the reasons that I asked for you all to turn on your cameras. Because if I give this whole presentation like this, I think I have completely changed the experience for all of you. Because now I'm just an ephemeral voice and you're pretty sure I'm here, but maybe it's pre-recorded. Who knows, right? So when I am working with students or when I'm having meetings, if people are willing to turn on their cameras for me, I'm so grateful because in addition to you getting a lot of um, signals from me about my enthusiasm for the content or where I feel really important that we need to emphasize certain things. I'm also getting engagement from you and I can see right away if I've said something that's confusing or you're not buying it or um, I've lost you like too long. We should have shut this down 20 minutes ago. All of those things are really important signals to me as well. Semantic noise, this one is a little bit more cut and dried. This is actual language barrier where we're talking about um, different dialects, maybe just linguistics. Maybe we're talking about slang where, you know, between age demographics, we don't know what certain terms mean. A lot of times we get stuck in our own jargon 
And we have a lot of jargon in libraries. We really do. And we need to be aware of that depending on who our audience is. Or technical lingo. These are all things that can interfere with the integrity of the message. So we need to think about that. If you're getting that sort of glazed look, one of the easy checks is mm, what's happening with my semantic noise here? Am I using phraseology that they don't understand? Um, or I need clarification because I have no idea what they just said. Psychological noise is a tough one because this one you can't see, you can't know. It may have the greatest impact on your interactions over any of those other things. And we all have it coming in strong from both sides of the interaction, right? So psychological noise is anything that is affecting your perception of the person on the other side of the communication. This is often driven by your past experiences. You might be preoccupied. This can be defensive feelings that you have because of past experiences. This might also be tied to bias, whether that's social bias, confirmation bias, negativity bias. Bias is subconscious on a lot of levels and very, very powerful. So one of the things that we all need to do on a regular basis is identify where our biases exist, think about those, and then check them so that we can ensure that we are not allowing them to impact our conversations and we can reframe our perceptions and our interactions with people. Uh, so I go through all of this and I mean, shoot, this feels like too much. How are you supposed to overcome all of this? And it also feels like I have just placed a great weight on your shoulders in terms of all that you are now responsible for negotiating with people when you communicate. But there's a lot of freedom in this quote from Kathy Caprino, where you are only 50% of every interaction and every relationship. You're not more, you're not less. So be fully accountable for your part, but don't take on being responsible for their part as well. This brings me a lot of comfort because I'm a fixer and I'm a pleaser and it's really hard for me when everyone's not happy. And I have to remember that I'm only 50% of every relationship and every interaction. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing here and come eyeball to eyeball with you again. As we were talking about those different types of noise, anything come up for you all in terms of, oh yes, this reminded me of an interaction that I've had with a patron or an issue that I have with a colleague. I can really see Jenny smiling like, yes it did, but I'm not gonna tell you, um, which is fine. <laughs> but I hope that as I was going through that, you can kind of start piecing that into specific encounters that you have had or specific um, behaviors of your own that you're thinking about. And it's kind of funny because I think every time I do this presentation, we have this um, tendency to say, and I really wish Bob was here because he really needs to hear this. But, and, and Bob probably does need to hear this. But the way that this actually makes a difference is if we really take it to heart for ourselves and we start to model this with others. And I truly believe that through our own example and sensitivities and thinking about removing barriers, we can sow seeds of change for others as well. Um, any questions about any of this that we have gone over so far? I'm waiting the appropriate Zoom time for questions because you have to wait a little longer. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Well, I'm gonna move right on. Um, now we get to get to the, the really fun stuff, which is where we talk about opportunities and some hard and fast strategies, things that we could, tangible things that we can do. In the chat, if you would, tell me uh, ballpark how many emails you think you get every day. 
there, so I can monitor it. 50, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how many emails do you get every day? 30 to 50, okay, very good. Now, what about social media posts? I got, some of us weren't into social media and that's fine, but you know, how many social media posts are you either making or reviewing every day? Yeah, great. Now let's think about those meetings. How many actual face-to-face -face interactions or online interactions in real time are you having? I'll just say for me, I'm thinking through my meetings today, I think I have eight, 12 to 15. Yeah, and every interaction with a different patron is one of those, all of your staff meetings, every phone call that you answer, oh yeah. And we didn't even talk about texts. How many texts are you sending? Oh my gosh, it's out of control for me. Those group chats are gonna just eat you up. Okay. <laughs> okay. My point is, it's a lot. Every single one of those interactions requires you to make a decision and takes a little bit of energy out of your bucket for the day. By the time we get to about two o'clock, we have taken a lot of energy and put it towards these communications efforts and we're getting tired. And as we get tired, we start to forget some of the good habits that we've put in place. All of these things can be overwhelming and it seems like there just continues to be more and more in terms of social media platforms and where we have to meet people in order to um, market effectively and I have students who I cannot get on the phone to save my life. If I text them, I can usually find them. Sometimes I have to find them on social media. So it's just, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. And every one of these interactions counts because every time we are sending one of those messages, we are either strengthening or weakening the quality of our service as librarians, or if you're looking at individual relationships, you're either pouring some good into that relationship or you're taking something away from it. There really isn't a lot of neutral ground there. So these things are, are very, very important. And everything that we just talked about with the exception of those meetings and those patron interactions, a big percentage of that is completely asynchronous. And that is tough. And here's why. There's a lot of differing opinions about this in terms of the actual percentage, but overwhelmingly, all psychological experts agree that an enormous percentage of communication is nonverbal. It can be as high as 95%. I've seen that statistic. About the lowest that I've seen is 80%. No matter which article you choose to hang your hat on, nonverbal communication is by far the majority. And that means that we have to be really careful and we have to work a little bit harder it, when, we're, when we're living in these asynchronous communications. Now, um, we are gonna talk about a few best practices. And one of the first ones that I would like to discuss is first impressions. But before I do that, I see that I do have a chat here. Oh, not liking the post, yes. That's tough. That's another one of those things where um, social media has made it harder for us because if we're face-to-face -face interaction, you know, you might say something and, and I might say, oh, yeah, I don't like that. I didn't agree with that, but we have opportunity for dialogue, right? Where you can actually start to see where I'm coming from and understand that it's not a place of malice. But if we're just on social media, all you get is that, I don't like what you just said, hard stop. And that creates a whole different ball game in terms of how we both feel about that interaction. We need to talk about first impressions. Um, which can seem like a bit of a digression, but I promise I'll pull it back. How long do you all think that you have to make a first impression? I'm alive. 
patron walks through your door, five seconds, five seconds, three seconds, 20 seconds. Okay. Seems either way, seems like we're all in agreement that it's pretty short. Yeah. Um, so again, depending on which article you want to look at, research tells us that it might be as small as a tenth of a second, which means you didn't even open your mouth. It means as soon as you see someone, you've made a lot of decisions about what you think about them, which is frightening in a lot of ways, isn't it? But it also means that there are a lot of small ways that we can take advantage of the first impression to make sure that it works to our advantage. Because here's the other kind of difficult fact is once that first impression is made, you can undo it, but it is like climbing a mountain. You will have to work 10 times harder to reset that impression than if you had just had made a good impression to start. So again, let's get it right if we can. And this isn't the part where you're supposed to feel bad if you made a bad first impression at one point. We've all done it, right? It's not the end of the world. But the, the better we can be about making a good first impression, the better off we are. And let's think about everything that's tied to nonverbal communication. Your facial expression, your body language, the environment that you present to people when they walk into your library or they walk into your office, whether or not you, you choose to take the phone call instead of putting it down and acknowledging them right away, these things make a huge difference. Okay. The other piece of this that's important to note that is that 90% of information that's transmitted to our brain is visual. So even though many of you said that you prefer to read about it, if you're trying to learn something, you are also engaging in a lot of physical or visual interaction with whatever it is that you are consuming. So that facial expression, your body language, the way that you're dressed, um, the environment that you show people, they're seeing more than they're hearing every single time. This is how our brains are wired to ingest information. This is why we love YouTube and TED Talks so much. So you have to think about these things when we're making first impressions and when we're helping our staff make first impressions and when we are heading into those conversations um, with stakeholders for the first time, whatever it is, your expression, your body language. And remember that a lot of what's happening here, I have been accused of RBF more than once in my life, okay? And what that is, is very rarely a reflection of whatever it is I'm seeing out here and 100% of whatever is going on in here. But the people who are looking at me do not know that. Same with our body language. Oftentimes when we're closed off, it's because of however we're feeling. It doesn't have a lot to do with the person on the other end of the interaction, but that's not how it comes across. These are some easy things that we can kind of mentally check often. So this, I think, you know, yeah, yeah, okay, first impressions, body language, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Just in case you don't believe me, I thought I would let you hear it from somebody else. So I'm going to share a clip. Speaking of TED Talks, I'm obsessed. Um, it is Amy Cuddy, who is a social psychologist. She works in the Harvard School of Business. Amazing. This is one of the most watched TED Talks of all time. So if this is redundant for you, I apologize. I'm only going to share about 15 seconds of this clip where she is addressing the impact of body language. Move things around here just slightly, here we go. Everybody seeing my screen? Okay. So social scientists have spent a lot of time looking at the effects of, of our body language or other people's body language on judgments. And we make sweeping judgments and inf inferences from body language. And those judgments can predict really meaningful life outcomes like who we hire or promote, um, who we ask out on a date. For example, uh, 
uh, Nalini Ambadi, a researcher at Tufts University, shows that when people watch 30 minute, uh, 30 second soundless clips of real physician patient interactions, their judgments of the physician's niceness predict whether or not that physician will be sued. So it doesn't have to do so much with whether or not that physician was incompetent, but do we like that person and how they interacted? Um, even more dramatic, Alex Todorov at Princeton has shown us that um, judgments of political candidates' faces in just one second predict 70% of US Senate and gubernatorial race outcomes. And even, let's go digital, emoticons used well in online negotiations can lead you to claim more value from that negotiation. If you use them poorly, bad idea, right? So those are just a few examples. I think it's always interesting to hear actual research that backs these things up. And those are not small things. One second, did you hear that? One second of facial expressions is dictating how people are going to likely vote about somebody. And it's funny to me that she, not funny, haha, -ha, but interesting, that she uses the term niceness. I asked my son the other day, because I was chatting with a different group last week about um, leadership and appreciative inquiry. And I said, well, what do you think, Ivan, my 10-year-old fount of wisdom, what do you think good leadership looks like? And he said, I think you need to be nice. And I think you need to set a good example. And I said, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's, that's pretty much summarizing 60 seconds or 60 minutes of my talk right there. You do it instead, bud. It's, it's so much cuter when you do it. But this idea of niceness is really important. And I would actually um, restate that to be kindness. We all respond to true kindness. And that's what we look for in the people that we trust. And those first impressions, those facial expressions, that body language is really people deciding whether or not we're kind. And that helps me understand how important it is because I want people to know that the librarians in their community are kind. I want my staff to understand that I am coming to them through a true spirit of kindness, not being critical. I want that for my students. Um, and I know you all want the same thing. It's what I love about this profession is, is it's filled with the kindest, most compassionate people in the entire world. I believe that with my whole heart. Oh, Jennifer, that is a great point. Masks are making facial expressions difficult to read. It's so true. I ran into a really good friend in Costco the other day and it took us 30 seconds to decide if we actually knew one another. You could tell we were, uh, uh. Um, I, I agree. So I actually think that's one of the reasons that many of us feel this sort of sustained sense of loneliness and we're feeling that extra heaviness because over the past 12 months, we aren't getting a lot of the nonverbal cues that we really rely on from people more so than we ever thought. We're also not touching each other anymore. We're not giving hugs. We're not shaking hands for our kiddos. That's really hard. We get a lot of things from those interactions. And so um, I'm really glad that you pointed that out because I think that's another thing that we need to be really aware of. It's another reason I think we have to put more effort into creating meaningful interactions with people whenever we can to help kind of fill that bucket. Yeah, I bet those kindergartners, it's hard for our biddies. All right, heading back. This is an interesting um, grouping of statistics. The space of your interaction is important. So if we're talking about hanging out one-on-one, -on -one, if you are less than 18 inches from somebody that's considered an intimate interaction. So we usually reserve those for our very good friends, our partners, our family members. Personal is considered two to three feet. So these are people we trust and we like well enough. If we don't know them very well, we're gonna go official at four to five feet. And if it's just a big public event, that 10 foot plus is considered appropriate. I think this is interesting because it helps me, again, kind of gauge um, where appropriate boundaries are with people because 
what you're not seeing, this is a really interesting article that I've linked to here, is the fact that especially in America, we Americans feel very strongly about the appropriate distance between people when we are chatting. We do not like it when somebody that we don't feel is a personal connect, co connection for us crosses over from official into that personal boundary. And that goes for the people that we're talking with too. And I have to, I, I'm sure you're kind of getting this. I have this sort of Labrador retriever personality where I just, I connect with somebody. I'm like, oh my gosh, and I kind of start leaning in and you can see people like stepping back. We are not there yet. So it, it is something that has helped me um, with my interactions and remembering that because I do kindness and, and niceness, those are really important things to me, but that doesn't mean that I can cross those boundaries. Those boundaries are equally important. And they're particularly important for those of us who work in the public service um, industry where we don't know everyone. And sometimes those boundaries and those spatial distances help keep us safe. And that's important too. Okay, a few easy ways that you can sabotage communication. This is another great TED talk. I'm not gonna make you watch any of it, but this man, um, Julian Treasure, does such a nice job of summarizing some of the key factors that really have a deleterious effect on our relationships or work culture. Um, and gossip is at the top of the list. And it's really hard because venting our frustrations is something that we are hardwired to do. I mentioned that negativity bias earlier. That's a tough thing. Once you have that negative first impression in place, you actually have negativity bias, which means you will look for other things that irritate you about that person or that continue to reinforce the fact that you don't like them. You didn't like how they looked at you. You didn't like how they greeted you. And now you're not noticing any of the perfectly fine or nice things that they do. You're only looking for the negativity bias. Gossip is like putting that on steroids. And um, it's certainly something that I have experienced as just doing so much damage within organizations. Judging. We love, again, I think we're hardwired to make judgments from way back in the day where we had to make judgments about the lion that was about to eat us. Like we know that's bad and we make those decisions really quickly. But now we've evolved and judging others is really damaging to the relationship. It's also really damaging to your own perception of other people. Making excuses is a fast track way to ensure that people do not trust you or will not count on you. And um, I think it's really important because we wanna explain ourselves when things go wrong, but accountability goes a long way with everybody that I know. Um, I, we all make tons of mistakes. We don't like that we make mistakes. It's hard for us to acknowledge that. When we own up to them, we can almost always fix them. But when we don't, then we're just in that spiral of not being able to have proactive problem solving. Exaggeration and lying is another thing that's, I mean, this all sounds so obvious. I'm gonna give you an example of this as a growth opportunity in my own life. I tend to say often when I'm giving feedback to students, that was so interesting. That was fabulous. That was incredible. And that's great. But when they hear me tell everybody that they're fabulous and incredible, all of a sudden it doesn't necessarily mean as much. It can just feel like lip service. So thinking about um, how exaggeration can impact how people are perceiving our feedback. This is a big one that I think our whole society and world really struggles with and we can help, but confusing facts and opinions. Your perception of whether or not a patron is friendly is an opinion. That is not a fact. Your perception of whether or not somebody is a good teammate or a productive member of the team is your opinion. It is not your fact for everybody. And I think it's important that we recognize those things and don't state them as facts. These are some logistical things that I think are really important to keep in mind. Disrespecting time, 
disrespecting that space, those spatial boundaries I mentioned, and disrespecting different communication preferences. You have to, ask, I think you have to ask people, especially people on your team, what their communication preferences are. I, can't, I learned two new things about my own husband yesterday by asking him those questions. <laughs> How, why, why don't we ask each other what we need? Why don't we ask? How do you prefer that I communicate with you? Time is the most valuable asset we have. And when we disrespect it, even in small ways, it undermines the quality of our relationships and it undermines how people are going to hear whatever you say. If you tell everybody else that they have to be there on time and then you yourself show up five minutes late or don't get your meeting started on time, listen, I get it, life happens, but you have sent a very clear message about how you feel about their time versus your own. If you call meetings and you don't have an agenda that honors other people's time and allows you to move efficiently through your content, you have sent a very clear message about how much you really feel their time is worth. And learning about people's preferences will al allow you to make key decisions about how you approach conversations with them. If you know that you have a person who prefers one-on-one -on -one communication, then that's how you are going to have the best chance of effective communication with them, particularly if it's something significant. Group interaction, same deal. Thinking about those things and weighing them, it's not possible to be all things to all people. But I think especially when you're trying to, when you're saying, I don't get it. Why are people reacting like this to this very basic news? It may be because the communication preferences were not being met for them. And so they actually are feeling really uncomfortable trying to process whatever it is that you're saying. I have found that a lot of communication issues come down to lack of expectations. People don't know what they were supposed to do. People aren't sure how to make us happy. People aren't sure what it is that's going to meet the mark. And trust me, I live this every day, I think, but I told you this. I have given it to you. I said it to you three different times in three different places. So, but I think, okay, maybe I need to say it again and I need to find a different way to say it. Obviously the email that I sent out to everybody did not get the message across. Some people didn't check their email. Some people skimmed it and missed the important piece of it. Some people just couldn't process it because they had 4,000 other interactions that were in their head that we all have, right? There's only so much we can process. So stating your expectations multiple times in multiple ways, sometimes reframing them to use different language is really important, I think, and helps a lot of people. Um, this is a completely different world than libraries, but I was chatting with a good friend of mine about their work culture in a Silicon Valley tech company. And on his team, five of them aren't really sure what their job is. They're not sure how they are supposed to protect their job or contribute to the value of the whole because it's not been clarified for them. That's a tough place to be in. So this isn't something that's just an issue for us in libraries. This is something that's a problem everywhere. And overlooking noise factors. As parents, we get this. What's the first question that we ask ourselves when our toddler is throwing a temper tantrum? We say, are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Do you need a nap? Right? We understand that there's noise impacting their behavior. Really turns out grownups are just glorified children we don't really change that much. We all have noise that's impacting us and our behavior all the time. I, quite frankly, I said it yesterday, you know, I got to the end of a day that had been packed AM to PM and I couldn't even let my child finish their request to play Minecraft. No, no, I'm done. I'm done with this discussion. And that, was, that wasn't fair. It was just because all of my noise from the day was in my head and I wasn't being fair in actually listening to what he needed at that time. Oh, I put gossip again. You know why? Because it's really, really important. I think it is such a, a, it's just 
the most dangerous thing that we can allow to fester in our organizations. This last one is complaining without proactive purpose, which is really me saying we need to help everyone on our team and everyone around us move from venting their frustrations to problem solving, because that's the difference. If you complain and you complain and you complain, we like to say, oh, I just needed to get that off my chest, right? Like, I just need to let this go. I just need to vent. Well, according to psychological resources, there is nothing that benefits you about venting without a purpose. All you're doing is forcing yourself to rehash and relive the same stress and anxiety that you had in the first place. So the more you're venting, you're doing it again and again. And depending on who you're venting to, they may be in the spirit of commiserating, actually fanning the fire, right? And um, exponentially adding to that anxiety and stress. But if we voice frustration in the spirit of how am I going to fix this problem, that's different. That's empowering. That's proactive. That leads to true change. It leads to trust, all good things. This is the HAIL method. I love acronyms because they make it easy to remember things. There is nothing earth shattering here. But it's one of those things where I think this would make a nice coffee cup that I could look at every day and remind myself, this is how it needs to be. Be honest, be authentic, demonstrate integrity, and demonstrate love and kindness. That's it. How easy is that? My son would love this. He would be fully on board with this as, uh, le as effective communication and leadership framework. So just to reframe this, because I was talking all about, oh, this is how we sabotage our communication. When you honor differences and preferences, that's huge. Not only are you communicating effectively, you are building trust, which is going to have exponential benefits across the board. But how do you do it? Well, you have to ask. You obviously can't ask every patron who comes in your building, <laughs> how would you like me to communicate with you today? That won't work. You can do it with your teams though. And I think you can subtly shift your observation of each individual and think, yep, I think they just want to smile and not the full verbal greeting. I can see that in them. We're really smart. We pick up so many things through those nonverbal communication cues. Think about easy ways that you can mitigate noise and remove barriers. So do you need to start having meetings with people at out in the meeting room or maybe by your fireplace where you can sit in chairs next to each other, or you need to get rid of that desk that's between you. Um, where can you remove barriers? Maybe you need to change the time of those meetings because if you are trying to have staff meetings at 1130 and they're not going well, hmm, angry, it's, it's true. And I, I'm, I'm terrible in meetings right after lunch too. Um, so, you know, just thinking about even the timing of our interactions can make a big difference. How are you stating your expectations? Are they clear? Um, are you repeating them? Don't make assumptions about whether or not your expectations have been effectively received and processed. A really good tactic is having people repeat expectations back to you. Um, I say this to my students all the time. Now, does everybody understand? And everybody's heads nod when we're in the full session. And as soon as we're out of that group meeting, I get 10 emails that make it clear that not everybody understood. That's fine. As long as they know that they can trust me and ask those questions after the fact, but we have to make sure that that happens. And sometimes you have to change the language that you're using. You might have to change your communication tool. Some things are not meant for email. In fact, a lot of things aren't meant for email. Some things aren't meant for asynchronous and you need to find a way to have back and forth dialogue so that it can be more of a real-time exchange. Here's a big one for me and it's something I really try hard to instill in my students, in my children, in, in myself. I try to live this. If I am going to come to you with a problem, or I'm going to talk about a problem, I need to pair it with a solution. It doesn't have to be a good solution. 
that's fine. But it needs to at least put us in the headspace of moving towards positive problem solving. And that's empowering. That means that we're not going to get stuck in the muck. That rhymed. <laughs> but instead, we're going to move towards that proactive place of positivity. How am I doing on time? Woo! A butterfly here. A lot of this comes down to active listening, which we know about. I'm going to move quickly through this. So much of active listening is nonverbal. This is eye contact. It's your facial expression, that space, your posture, um, and refraining from distraction. It's really hard not to get that dopamine hit when we look over at the ding from our phone, right? We are actually addicted to these things, but it sends a strong message to people when they take priority over everything else. There's a lot of ways that we can um, make sure that we are eliminating distraction and really focusing in on our communication target. I mentioned this before. So here we are living in this digital and asynchronous world in a lot of instances. Choose carefully and choose wisely. I just read an article from the Harvard Business Review written by some attorneys who said they are talking to clients endlessly right now about stop saying things you shouldn't be saying on Zoom calls. Stop emailing them. Stop using Slack to say all of the things. It is all discoverable. These things, this digital footprint, it is forever. And whether or not you fear lawsuits, which you probably don't, it's still really important to make careful decisions about what we choose to document and the tool that we use for different kinds of interactions. If you need a running written record of something, email is absolutely the right choice. But if you need to have that give and take exchange, don't rely on email because you're gonna lose out on all of those nonverbal cues that both parties desperately need. Interaction versus documentation is really the secret to making those choices. Err on the side of caution <laughs> because if you're not sure about it, don't put it in writing. If you're not sure you wanna see that email again, don't put it in writing, don't text it. Please don't make a post on social media about it. A lot of the issue with Zoom is people don't like to get on the camera or they're worried about utilizing the technology. You don't have to use this. You can find other ways to activate technology platforms for this, but it's not about getting on the camera. It's about giving each other the feedback that you need to have effective communication through those nonverbal signals. So if you can try to encourage people to do this, I think you're gonna be amazed at how it changes your interaction and how it changes your own perception of the communications because how many of you talk into the black void for a while and then you end the meeting and you go, I'm, I have no idea how that went. <laughs> I see I've just lost Tammy. I don't, <laughs> that was perfect demonstration, Tammy. I don't know if you did that on purpose, but I appreciate it. And the stop it was really just me remembering to tell you about that article because we really are documenting anything that happens in that digital space. This is my last slide for you because I think that all librarians really do have superpowers. You have communication superpowers because whether or not you've acknowledged it, you are actually trained for this as we have learned how to be sensitive to people's information needs, their need for human connection. I think that we really are maybe better at this than a lot of other people. And so here is my call to action for you to activate your superpowers as librarians and apply it to every communication interaction that you have. Really, it's just about being awesome librarians at the end of the day, and you're already there. If you have any questions about any of this, feel free to email me. You can find me on Twitter, although I'll be honest, that's not, I'm not super regular there, but I will find you eventually. And this is my phone number. Feel free to shoot me a text or give me a call anytime. I love to talk about this stuff with people. So I don't know if we have any time for questions, Tammy, I'll leave that to you. But if you do have any questions and we have time for them, I would take them now. Yeah, if you don't mind, absolutely. If anyone has questions, go for it. Sure thing.
I'm just going to go back through and look at the chat and see if I missed anything. I think it looks like everybody's feeling pretty good. But if That's you have any questions after I leave, feel free to email me. Great information. Thank you. You're welcome. It was really good to be with all of you today. I look forward to seeing you when the library gods put us in each other's circle again. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Erica.